Hello world, Sean Grooms here with Free Code Camp, and in this video I will be giving you three tips on how to learn discrete mathematics. The first tip is to stay calm. People often hear the word mathematics and panic, and when you panic you stop listening, and if you stop listening you can't learn the material. So if you simply stay calm then you will be able to learn the material better. You aren't being graded on the subject so there's no need to panic. The second is to rewind. Uh, you can rewind the videos at any time. And when I learned discrete mathematics, I didn't have this opportunity. So in theory, you should be able to learn the material much faster than I was ever able to. So I strongly encourage rewinding videos. Finally, explain. Once you think you understand the material of the videos, you can try to explain the material out loud either to yourself or to a friend. If no one's around or you feel weird talking to yourself, then you can try to explain it to a uh, rubber ducky. There is a concept in programming called rubber duck debugging, uh, which is where programmers go through their code line by line, trying to identify bugs in their code by explaining it to a rubber ducky. So similarly, if you go through the material of the videos uh, subject by subject, you will soon be able to identify uh, any gaps in your understanding of the material. In this video, I'll be explaining what discrete mathematics is and why it's important for the field of computer science and programming. Discrete mathematics is a branch of mathematics that deals with discrete or finite sets of elements rather than continuous or infinite sets of elements. Imagine trying to run a program that requires an infinite number of executions to complete a task. It's obvious to say that the program would run forever and the task would never be completed because there are an infinite number of executions. In order to avoid this problem, we approximate the continuous sets with discrete sets. Now you may be thinking, I never use math that involves infinite sets, but I promise that you do. The simplest example is with a circle. A circle, by definition, is an infinite number of points equidistant from a fixed point. And the problem with this is that if we try to write a program that prints out all of these points, it will run forever because there are an infinite number of points and therefore an infinite number of executions. So this is physically impossible. That's why if we zoom in here, you can see that there, when you come down to here, there are all these points, but in reality, we should have even more points between these points. And then if we zoom in on those, we'll have more points between those points, and we can never complete the task. Now we've all seen circles on computers, so what's going on? How, how is this possible? We just established that it's impossible. Well, the answer is that they're approximations. For example, consider regular polygons. Uh, regular polygons, like a triangle or a square or a pentagon, those don't really look like circles, but if you keep increasing the number of vertices, uh, eventually you'll start getting hexagons, octagons, dodecagons, hexadecagons, uh, icosagons. You can see that these regular polygons, the more and more you keep increasing the number of vertices, which the vertices are equidistant from a fixed point, they will eventually approximate a circle. Eventually, they will be indistinguishable to the naked eye and will look identical to a circle. And in this video, I'll be explaining what sets are. A set is a collection of distinct objects called elements or members. An element is essentially anything you want it to be. And uh, for example, elements could be numbers, letters, variables, more sets, or nothing at all. Um, sets are usually denoted by capital letters, such as uh, capital A, capital B, C, E, or F. And uh, we say that the set contains elements. For example, um, we could say that the set A equals the set containing the element 5. Or we can say that 5 is an element of A. Now, um, I will be introducing a lot of symbols like this. This just means is an element of. And it'll save us a lot of time in uh, future videos. And I don't have to write out is an element of each time. So that'll come in handy. So what does a set actually look like? Well, there are two common uh, types of notation for sets. And the one I'm introducing in this video is roster notation. And it looks like this. It's just curly braces with elements inside separated by commas, which is very similar to JavaScript. Uh, the only difference being that in 
math, we use curly braces, and in JavaScript, we use a square bra uh, bracket. So uh, now let's just walk through these. So the, uh, the set A equals the set containing the element 5. That's how you would read this. The set B equals the set containing elements 2, 3, and 4. The set C equals the set containing elements D, F, and G. Now, D, F, and G, um, they're not... They don't have to be variables. They're, they're either variables or they could be characters. It just depends on the context. The set E, it contains no elements in this case, which has an impact um, that you'll see in future videos. And finally, the set F equals the set containing elements A, B, and C. In this case, our elements are sets, so we would read this as F equals the set containing the set containing the element 5 the set containing elements 2, 3, and 4, and the set containing D, F, and G. So in the next video, I'll be going over uh, a different form of set notation in addition to introducing you to some common sets. And this will set us up, eventually my goal is to bring us up to being able to define and understand algorithms. And this is where we have to begin. In this video, I'll be introducing interval notation and talk about some common sets. This will lay the foundation for the next video on set builder notation. The beauty of interval notation is that it allows us to efficiently describe uh, all numbers between two values. Suppose we wanted to say that the variable x is between 0 and 1. Well, we could do just that. We could say that x is an element of zero, the interval 0 to 1 or which is really saying x is greater than 0 and x is less than 1. Likewise, if we wanted to say that x is greater than or equal to 0 and x is less than 1, then we have to switch this to a square bracket. All we're doing is we are now including the number 0 in the interval. Also, we can include 0 and we can also include 1 in the interval by using square brackets on both sides. So it's greater than or equal to and less than or equal to. Uh, and now I'll talk about some common sets, the first one being the null set, which is the same thing as the empty set, which is just there are no elements contained within the set, and this will come in handy uh, in the future. The funny N here is the natural numbers, which is the set containing elements 1, 2, 3, and then these three dots here are called an ellipsis, which tells us that the pattern continues. So N is the set containing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way up to infinity. This funny n with a 0 is the natural numbers, however, it includes the value 0 within the set. So it's 0, 1, 2, and then the ellipsis tells us all the way to infinity in an integer fashion, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, and finally, we have all of the integers, positive and negative, and non-negative, which is 0, negative 1, negative 2, all the way down to negative infinity, and 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to infinity. In this video, I'll be introducing the rational numbers and set builder notation. The rational numbers are defined as a ratio of two integers. And examples include the integers themselves, uh, terminating decimals, and repeating decimals. So let's start with uh, repeating decimals. If we let 10x equal 9.999 repeating, then if we divide by both sides by 10, then x equals 0 0.999 repeating. And if we subtract x from 10x, we have 9x equals 9. And then divide both sides by 9, we have x equals 1. And then if we multiply by 10, both sides by 10, we have 10x equals 10. So now we have 10x equals 10, but 10x also equals 9.99 repeating. So we have now, and these are in fact true, 9.99 repeating equals 10. So we've, we can now express 10x as an integer, which is a, uh, a um, rational number. We can put 10 divided by 1, which is a ratio. So an, uh, another problem we have is terminating decimals. If we have 2.78 equal to y, then we can just easily say 278 divided by 100 equals y as well. These are two integers, and uh, it's, a, it's another rational number. So a convenient way to define these or is denoted with a Q, and this is called set builder notation. We have the Q equals the set containing elements 
uh, a divided by b such that a and b are elements of the integers with the only condition that b cannot equal zero. If you divide by zero, uh, it's, it's undefined. It doesn't mean anything. So um, if you're interested in that, I recommend Googling it. I think it's interesting. In this video, I'll be giving an example of a non-rational number. If the square root of 2 were a rational number, then by definition, it must be expressed as the ratio of two integers. If we then square both sides, we have 2 equals a squared divided by b squared. Uh, if we multiply both sides by b squared, we have 2b squared equals a squared. And from this, we know that a squared is even. a squared is even because we have 2 times some integer, which is b squared. Since a squared is even, we know that a is even because a squared equals 2 times some integer. The integer I chose was 2k squared. That means that a times a can be expressed as 2k times 2k, which is to say that a equals 2k. I can now substitute 2 times 2k squared for a squared, and that leaves us with b squared equals 2k squared once these 2s cancel out. Now, this also means that b squared is even because b squared equals 2 times some integer, which is to say that b is also even following this same logic. Now, if we go back to our original uh, premise, uh, the square root of 2 equals a divided by b, um, where a divided by b is an irreducible fraction. But since a is an even number and b is also an even number, we can express these numbers as 2k and 2l. But these 2s here will reduce, meaning that we'll have uh, the square root of 2 equals k divided by l. But since this reduced, since this is no longer explicitly represented as a divided by b, and it reduced to k divided by l, we know that we do not have a rational number. Now, there's a more specific way to uh, define these numbers, or, or classify these numbers, but we need set operators in the next video. In this video, I'll be defining four binary operators for sets. I've defined uh, two sets, A and B, to help give some examples. So the first is A union B, which equals a set containing elements P such that P is an element of A or P is an element of B. The next is the intersection. A intersection B equals the set containing elements P such that P is an element of A and P is an element of B. The next is the set difference of A and B, which equals the set containing P, or elements P, such that P is an element of A and P is not an element of B. And finally, we have the symmetric difference, which is uh, going to be very helpful when you actually complete the symmetric difference algorithm challenge. So the symmetric difference of A and B equals uh, the set difference of A and B union with the set difference of B and A. And finally, I will uh, fi define the irrational numbers, which I hinted to at the end of last video. So the irrational numbers are simply the real, number, real numbers uh, minus the rational numbers, and that equals the irrational numbers. In this video, I will be using Venn diagrams to give a graphical representation of the set operators we learned in the previous video. So if you recall the definition of A union B, you know that A union B equals the set containing elements X such that X is an element of A or X is an element of B. So if we let this circle represent the set A and we let this circle represent the set B, then that means that X can land anywhere in any of these circles, which is why this red, the uh, entire region is shaded red. We're saying that this red region represents all possible values of x. And if we recall the definition of a, of a intersection b, that equals the set containing elements x, such that x is an element of a and x is an element of b, which is why the overlap, uh, where a and b overlap, is, is shaded red. We're saying all possible values of x are this red region. Now, the set difference of A and B equals the set containing elements X, such that X is an element of A, and X is also not an element of B. 
which is why it's just this region here. None of the uh, elements are within B. The set difference of B and A is the set containing elements X, such that X is an element of B, and X is not an element of A. And finally, the symmetric difference of A and B I defined as uh, the union of A minus B and B minus A. So we take uh, this region and this region, and we take the union of it, which is why this is the resulting region. There's no overlap between the two. Now, this is a really good way to familiarize yourself with the concept of uh, set operators. However, don't rely on it. You should really focus on the definitions as it will help you out in the long term. In this video, I'll be introducing the concept of subsets and supersets. The dots on the board here represent elements of a set. The lines represent the sets themselves. These lines have been labeled B, A, and U. We can say that B is a subset of A because B contains because all elements of B are elements of A. We can also say that B is a proper subset of A because all elements of B are elements of A and uh, there are elements of A that are not within uh, the set B. We can also say that the set A is a superset of the set B because A contains all of the elements of B. And being even more specific, we can say that A is a proper superset of B because uh, A contains all elements of B and there are elements of A that are not elements of B. What we cannot say is that U is a proper subset of A. Although the circle here is bigger than A, uh, like it just takes up more space, it doesn't contain any more elements. So all the elements, so U contains all elements of A, however U does not contain any extra elements. So U is a subset of A, and A is actually a subset of U. Um, U is a superset of A, and A is also a superset of U. So the sets A and U in this case are actually equal. In this video, I'll be introducing the concept of the universal set and complements. So I want to begin by talking about the universal set, which is commonly referred to as the universe. Now the reason I use this fancy looking U here is that I was defining the universe, which is to say the maximum boundaries of my set, my biggest set. Everything outside of this blue circle here doesn't exist. I mean, it, in terms of the sets, nothing exists. I don't even exist. Computer doesn't exist, you don't exist. But everything within it does. So that's a very important key. Now, if I don't define this, if, if I don't define my universal set, then we just assume it to be the uh, real numbers. So if I just erase this, then, um, you know, this will just be the real numbers, which is what we've talked about in previous videos. So the other thing I want to talk about is complements. So if I say, if I'm looking for the complement of B, and uh, I'll, I'll put a more formal definition up. If I'm looking for the complement of B, then um, it is everything that is not within B. So all the elements not within B are going to be part of the complement. So in this case, it would look like this. If I just highlighted everything, it would be everything within the universe still. And then... So that is the complement of B. It's all the elements that are not in B. So that's that's quite a bit of quite a bit. I mean, you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So since this is the real numbers, these little dots here would represent all the numbers, all every single value, rational, irrational, that are not within B. So if this is one and two, or if, or better yet, how about this? This is the uh, rational numbers, and these are the integers. So these would be, everything outside of this would be the irrational numbers, and 
uh, the non-integer values. In this video, I'll be giving examples for subsets and supersets. So if you look at this blue line here, this represents our universal set. Uh, it, we've defined it to be the integers from 1 to 11. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 11. Don't let it concern you that there are elements outside of our universe. Um, that just means that they are, I mean, that just means they're not in the universe that we have in question right now. So it's no different than having stars outside of your galaxy. You're not concerned by that. It's just a matter of fact. So if you look at this green line, uh, what, what set would that be? Well, it contains elements 3, beta, and gamma. So does B. B contains 3, beta, and gamma. So this would be the set B. Likewise, this set here, it contains elements 3, 1, and x. Well, A contains 3, 1, and x. So this is the set a. And finally, this set uh, contains elements 1 and 3. This set contains elements 1 and 3. So this is the set C. Now, what can be said about these sets? Well, we have, uh, we can say that C is a subset of the universe because all elements of C are elements of the universe. Furthermore, we can say that uh, the set B is not a subset of the universe because there are elements of B that are not within the universe. Also, we can say that the universe is not a subset or a superset of A because there's elements of A that are not within uh, or not contained by the universe. And finally, we can say that the universe is a proper superset of C because the universe contains all elements of C except and, and there are elements within the universe that are not within the set C. So if we wanted to be more specific, we could actually say that C is a proper subset of the universe. In this video, I'll be going over examples of complements. So in this video, I've defined the universe to be the integers 1 through 5, and it's denoted graphically by this blue line. And if we recall the definition of uh, the complements with, or with regards to A, uh, we have A complement equals the set containing elements X such that x is an element of the universe and x is not an element of A. So in that case, we can look at uh, all the integers, 1 through 5, and if it contains any element from A, we throw it out. So uh, in this case, if we look at the integer 1, we know that that's not going to be there because that's an A. If we look at uh, the integer 2, that'll be in our set. If we look at the integer 3, that won't be in our set because that's also an A. And then 4 and 5 are uh, within the universe and they're not within A. Next we have B complement. Well, we know that 1, 2, 4, and 5 are within the universe and they're not within uh, B. And lastly we have C complement. 2, 4, and 5 are within the universe and they're not within C because we had to exclude 1 and 3. I want to begin this video by reviewing our definitions of the union and intersection. After that, I'll be introducing two algebraic laws for sets. So the definition of A union B equals set containing elements X such that X is an element of A or X is an element of B. Also, A intersection B is defined as the set containing elements X such that X is an element of A and X is an element of B. So when I, in, I introduce the inimpotence law, it should be clear that A union A equals A, because A union A is defined as the set containing elements X such that X is an element of A, or X is an element of A, which should yield, or you, you should see why that equals the set A. Also, A intersection A equals the set containing elements X such that X is an element of A and X is an element of A, which it should also be clear why that is the set A. Um, next we have our identity laws. So identity laws are uh, laws where we have a given set and we're performing an operation on that set with a given element. Uh, these elements are the identity elements. So for this case we have the null set and the universal set are our identity elements. So A union null set equals A and by definition that means that a union null set equals the set containing elements x such that x is an element of A or x is an element of the null set. But since we know that the null set is empty, 
we can't possibly have any elements in there. Um, so it's really saying that A union the null set is equal to the set containing elements X such that X is an element of A, or more simply, uh, it equals A. I want to begin this video by reviewing the definition of complements. So the definition of a complement of a set, for, the, for instance, uh, the complement of A, equals the set containing elements X such that X is not an element of A. I will now be going over two new algebraic laws for sets. The first are the law of complements. The law of complements states that if we take the union of a set and its complement, it equals the universe. Or if you take the complement of the null set, it equals the universe. Furthermore, uh, the intersection of a set and its complement is the null set. And that should be clear because if you have uh, the set A and you are intersecting it with everything that is not inside A, uh, there's clearly not going to be any overlap. So you're going to have an empty set. Uh, the next one is the law of involution. So involution uh, states that if we have a uh, state here, let's call, we'll call it state 0, and we feed that state to a function, in this case we're going to feed it to the complement function, then when it gets to state 1, if we again feed it through the exact same function, the complement function, it will result in state 0 again. In this case, if we fed state a, uh, if we fed set A through this uh, cyclical function here, then we would have A, feed it through complement, we get A complement. Feed it back through the function, we get A complement complement, which equals A. And then we can have A complement complement complement, which would be A complement, and then you get the idea. It's, it's cyclical. In this video, I'm introducing two more algebraic laws for sets, associativity and commutativity. Associativity is uh, essentially just saying that we can regroup uh, the sets that we are talking about. So um, A intersection B intersection C, that is A intersecting with the set B intersection C, is equal to the set A intersection B intersection C. And if you look at the definitions of uh, intersection, you can actually go through and figure out why this is, and, and I'm pretty sure you'll be able to do that based on the videos that uh, you've already watched. And the same is true for the union. Uh, commutativity is essentially just saying that we can um, switch which side our sets are relative to the, the operation. So A intersection B is the same thing as B intersection A. And the same thing is A union B is equal to B union A. So if we look at the actual definition, we have uh, A intersection B, is defined as the set containing elements x such that x is an element of a and x is an element of b. And that's going to equal the set containing elements x such that x is an element of b and x is an element of a. So if you just look at these uh, the conditions for, these, for the set builder notation here, it's essentially just a uh, argument of grammar at this point. So uh, basic English will tell you that you can uh, just switch which side that you have these on. In this video, I'll be introducing another algebraic law of sets, the distributive law. The distributive law is simply saying that the set and operation will be distributed over another set and operation. For instance, A intersection B union C equals A intersection B union A intersection C. So I thought it might be helpful to use uh, Venn diagrams for the uh, conceptual idea of this, and then I'll do a separate video on the actual definition. So if we look at A here, and we separate A, and then we decide to separate B union C, then when we actually go to find the union, or the intersection of these two regions, it's easy to see that it is this region. So hopefully, for the purposes of equality, this region here will match this region here. So let's get right to it. We have A intersection B. So we have the set A and the set B. So that means that A intersection B is going to be this region here. 
and we have to also find A intersection C, so that's this region. And if we take the union of those two regions, then we're left with all of this jazz. So it looks like they are in fact equal. But to be more rigorous, we'll uh, revisit the actual definition of the intersection and the unions in the next video. In my previous video on subsets and supersets, I stated that to show equality, you have to prove that each side of an equation are, are uh, subsets of each other. So to prove the distributive law, we're going to have this video, we're going to have the next video. In this video, I'm going to be showing that A is a... a a intersection B union C is a subset of A intersection B union A intersection C. So let's start the proof. Suppose that X is an element of A intersection B union C. Then X is an element of A and X is an element of B union C by definition of the intersection. So we still know that X is an element of A and by definition we know that X is an element of B or x is an element of c. From this we can deduce that x is, x is an element of a and x is an element of b or x is an element of a and x is an element of c. Now by definition we can uh, put this or rewrite this as x is an element of a intersection b or x is an element of a intersection c. And finally we can deduce that x is an element of a intersection b union A intersection C. So there you have it. We've shown that since X is an element of A intersection B union C and X is an element of A intersection B union A intersection C, uh, X is in both of these and therefore A intersection B union C is in fact a subset of A intersection B union A intersection C. In this video, I have the proof of the second case for the distributive law. In this case, we're showing that A intersection B union A intersection C is a subset of A intersection B union C. So let's start by saying that uh, suppose that X is an element of A intersection B union A intersection C. Then we know that X is an element of A intersection B or x is an element of A intersection C. And we know this because of the definition of the union. From here, we can uh, then state that x is an element of A and x is an element of B, or x is an element of A and x is an element of C. From that, we can deduce that x is an element of A and x is an element of B or x is an element of C. And here, we, um, we sort of factored out the x is an element of A and, and then regrouped x is an element of B or x is an element of C. And from here we can, uh, by definition, write x is an element of A and x is an element of B union C, which finally we can state x is an element of A intersection B union C, which is what we wanted to show. So there you have it. We've proved that uh, x is an element of both of these, and therefore this is a subset of this. And we've shown that uh, both sides of the equation are subsets of each other, and therefore the distributive law is, in fact, uh, true. It's proven. In this video, I'll be going over an example of the distributive law. So if you look at A intersection B union C, that is supposed to equal A intersection B union A intersection C. So if we can if we decompose this equation and look at, uh, let's start with A intersection B, then that equals singleton 3, based off from these predetermined sets. And then if we look at A intersection C, that equals the set 1, 3. So the union of these two is going to be the set uh, containing elements 1 and 3. Now if we look at B union C, that equals the set containing elements 1, 3, beta, and gamma. And if we take the intersection of that set with A, we're left with a set containing elements 1 and 3, which is good because now we've shown that this is equal to that. Now if we look at A union B intersection C, that's supposed to equal A union B intersection A union C. So if we analyze B intersection C, that equals singleton 3, and then A union B 
right here, equals 1, 3, x, beta, gamma. And A union C equals the set containing elements 1, 3, and x. So when we take the intersection of these two sets, we're left with the set containing elements 1, 3, and x. And when we take the union of B intersection C with A, we're left with the set containing elements 1, 3, and x, which is exactly what we wanted. So, yay, we've shown that these are in fact true. In this video, I'll be introducing the very last algebraic law of sets, known as De Morgan's Law. De Morgan's Law was founded by Augustus De Morgan, and it states that the complement of a union is the intersection of the complements. Or, it says that the complement of the intersection is a union of the complements. So we're going to prove that the uh, complement of the union of A and B is the in, is in fact equal to the uh, complement of A intersected with the complement of B. So to do this we have to show that uh, the complement of A union B is a subset of A complement intersection B complement and vice versa. So let's get started. Uh, suppose that X is an element of A union B complement. If that's the case, then by definition, x is not an element of A union B. And if x is not an element of A union B, that is, if x is not an element of the region A union B, which is the red here, then surely x is not an element of A, and x is not an element of B. And if that's the case, then by definition, x is not an element of A complement, and x is not an element of B complement. Therefore, x is not an element of A complement intersection B complement. So if we go to the other side here, uh, we start by saying, let's, let's suppose that X is an element of A complement, intersection B complement. Then by definition, X is an element of A complement, and X is an element of B complement. By definition of the complements, X is not an element of A, and X is not an element of B. And uh, with the same logic, X is not an element of A union B, because X is not an element of this region and x is not an element of this region. So surely it's not an element of the two regions combined. And by definition of complements, x is an element of A union B complement. In this video, in this video, I'll be giving examples of De Morgan's law. De Morgan's law states that the complement of the intersection equals the union of the complements and that the complement of the union equals the intersection of the complements. So if we check out these new, uh, th this new universal set here, it is equal to the set containing integers such that uh, x is greater than or equal to 0 and x is less than or equal to 5. Or more simply, the universe equals the set containing integers from 0 to 5. So if we decompose our first equation, uh, a intersection b equals singleton 3, uh, the complement of A intersection B is going to be integers from 0 to 5, excluding A intersection B. So 0, 1, 2, 4, and 5. Now the uh, complement of A is equal to, two, to 0, 2, 4, and 5, because A contains the uh, integers 1 and 3, so those are excluded. And B complement is going to be equal to 0, 1, 2, 4, 5, because B contains 3, so it's excluded. So the intersection, or the uh, union rather, of A complement and B complement equals 0, 1, 2, 4, and 5, which is in fact equal to the complement of A intersection B, which is what we wanted. So the next equation, we have A union B, and that's equal to uh, 1, 3, x, beta, gamma. Now the complement of that is equal to 0, 2, 4, 5, because we've excluded everything from uh, a union B. And now if we look at A complement intersection B complement, we also have the set containing elements 0, 2, 4, and 5, so which is exactly what we wanted, so now we know that these two are equal. So there you have it. Both of our equations worked out, and we can happily use De Morgan's Law. In this video, I'll be explaining what logic is and why we need it. I want to begin with an excerpt from the Book of Proof by uh, Richard Hammack. This is a free textbook and it's excellent. You can find it online 
and it covers all foundational mathematics to include uh, discrete mathematics, and I, I cannot recommend it enough. Um, so the excerpt is, logic is a systematic way of thinking that allows us to deduce new information from old information and to parse the meaning of sentences. So what this is saying is that essentially with, without logic, we wouldn't be able to deduce or um, move from point A to point B and, or make claims from point A to point B in a 100% affirmative, uh, no questions asked way. <laughs> And uh, so, that, so that's very important for mathematics. If you couldn't do that in mathematics, then um, it, it would all fall apart. You, there, were, there would be no certainty. There would be no foundation, no argument for us to stand on. And we would just be a bunch of people um, throwing numbers about and making guesses, essentially. So it's very, very important. Uh, the parsing, uh, the other part of the quote, to parse the meaning of sentences, won't make sense until later videos when we actually um, do that. So just bear with me on that one. So uh, why should you care about programmers? So, well, programmers use algorithms, or well, programmers write code, first of all. Code uses algorithms. Algorithms is uh, essentially just math, and mathematics requires logic. So it's that simple. In this video, I'll be introducing the notion of a proposition. A proposition is simply a uh, declarative statement with a verifiable truth value. They are usually denoted by lowercase letters. So if we have this lowercase p equals rain falls from the sky. Now that's a true statement. Rain does fall from the sky. But it could have been a false statement. Like Q. Q equals Ghana is a country in Asia. Ghana is not a country in Asia. Ghana is a country in Africa. So this is a false proposition or a false statement. R, uh, what are you doing? There's no truth value that can be assigned to that. It's just, it's just a question. It's considered an open statement. S equals wash the laundry. Again, this is an open statement. It has no truth value to it. It's, it's a command. Five equals four plus 89. Uh, that again, that, that, that does actually have a uh, truth value to it. Uh, but it's again, it's a false statement because 5 does not equal 4 plus 89. 7 equals alpha. I, I don't know if it does. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I don't know what alpha is, so this is an open statement. Um, we can't verify the truth of this. 3 equals 5 divided by 0. This is a proposition. This, is, this has a truth value, because uh, 3 does not equal 5 divided by 0. That's, 5 divided by 0 is undefined. And then 99 times 1 third equals 33. So this does have a verifi verifiable truth value, and it's true. In this video, I'll be introducing the concept of composite propositions. Just like regular propositions, composite propositions are declarative statements with a verifiable truth value. Uh, composite propositions are made up of sub-propositions. And uh, in this video, we're going to talk about the conjunction and the disjunction. So the first one I want to introduce is the conjunction. That is P and Q. That's how you would read this, P and Q. And so this composite proposition here is rain falls from the sky and Ghana is a country in Asia. So the two sub-propositions in this would be P, P and Q. Um, and this has a verifiable truth value because rain falls from the sky, because that is a true statement. But the statement Q, Ghana is a country in Asia, is false. Uh, we have P and Q, we have true and false, which means that it's false. One of them is false. And we'll talk about this more when we get into truth tables. The next is the disjunction, P or Q, that's read as or. Rain falls from the sky, or Ghana is a country in Asia. So again, we have true or false this time. So only one of these need to be true in order for everything to be true. And therefore, P or Q is a true statement. In this video, I'll be introducing truth tables. Truth tables are the easiest way to visualize uh, why something is true or false. And they're really convenient when we start getting up into 
uh, con conjunctions and disjunctions. So if you remember P and Q, P is defined as rain falls from the sky and Q is Ghana is a country in Asia, then P or Q, or both P and Q have two possible values, true or false. They're primitive propositions. So we just put them in a table, true and false, and then true or false. But uh, I, I circled these because I know that P is true and I know that Q is false. But when I analyze a conjunction or a disjunction, I have to add two more rows to the truth table. And that's because if you like, if you imagine this as starting on a path here, you can choose to go either true or false. When it, say I took true, when I get to the end of that path, I can then choose true or false again. So I'm stuck with uh, four different possibilities here. The first one being true, 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 false, and then false, true, and then false, false. So when I actually go to my table here, I have true, 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 false, and yada yada, and then uh, when I stick in my conjunction, I have true and true equals true, uh, true and false equals false, true and, uh, false and true equals false, and then false and false equals false. P or Q, true or true equals true, true or false equals uh, true, false or true equals true, and false or false equals false. And these are by the definitions of the conjunction and the disjunction. That's why that's why these values take on true or false. In this video, I'll introduce our first two algebraic laws of logic, idempotence and identities. These are the same laws we saw in set theory. If you recall, idempotence is a, when you can take a proposition and apply a binary operator to that proposition over and over and will never change the value of the original proposition. For instance, P is the logical equivalent, that's what these mean, the logical equivalent of P or P, which is the logical equivalent of P and P. And if you recall the definition of uh, the disjunction and the conjunction, you should be able to figure out why this occurs. Now, the uh, identity law states that if we take a proposition and we have a conjunction with true, a truth value, a, a true value, then it will always yield uh, that original proposition. Likewise, if we have a uh, disjunction with a proposition and false, it will always yield the original proposition. That's why we have P is the logical equivalent of P or false, which is the logical equivalent of P and true. And uh, finally, <laughs> we have uh, true and false, the identities of true and false. So if you have the disjunction of true with any proposition, then you will always yield a true value. And if you have a conjunction with any proposition and false, it will always yield the false value. In this video, I'll be introducing two more algebraic laws of logic, the law of complements and the law of involution. We start by examining our primitive proposition, P. We know that P either is true or false. If we look at the negation of P, which is read as not P, then we know that uh, P is false and true, because not P is defined as uh, when P is true, not P is false, and when P is false, not P is true. So the law of involution tells us that if we have a proposition and we feed it through a function twice, we'll end up in the same spot. So if we have uh, proposition P starting at state 0, feed it through a function, the negation function, it'll bring us to state 1 as not P. If we feed not P through the function, it'll bring us back to state 0, which is P, or known as not not P. So uh, P is logically equivalent to not not P. That's what involution tells us. We then analyze the law of complements, which tells us that the uh, disjunction of P and its negation, not P, will be the logical equivalent of the true value. So it is, a, it is known as a tautology. It is always true. Uh, and that's the corresponding truth table here. It also tells us that uh, a proposition and the conjunction of its negation is always false, which is known as a fallacy. So you can go through this truth table and you'll see that 
we have a tautology, fallacy, tautology, tautology, fallacy, and fallacy. In this video, I'll be introducing another algebraic law of logic, commutative law. So we start by looking at all possible cases of P and Q. We know that based on the path problem that we did when I first introduced truth tables, we know that there's four possible cases for both the disjunction and the conjunction of P and Q. So if we analyze this, we know that true and true for the disjunction of P and Q is going to yield true. And also this is going to be true and false yields true, false and true yields true, and false and false yields true. So all we're doing for the commutative law is switching the order of Q and P on the uh, operation. So instead of having P or Q, we have Q or P. So in fact, we do have true, 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 false. So we've shown that both P or Q and Q or P are logically equivalent. For the conjunction of P and Q, by definition, we know that true and true is going to yield true. True and false yields false. False and true yields false. And false and false yields, yields false. So when we commute P and Q and we have Q and P, uh, it's not surprising that we get the exact same answer, which is good because now we've shown that P and Q is logically equivalent to Q and P. In this video, I'll be introducing the associative law and the distributive law for logic. Now, previously, we've only dealt with two primitive propositions. So that's why we've only ever had uh, four possible outcomes in our true or false path. Now, we're going to take this a step further, and we're going to have eight propositions, or eight possible outcomes for our um, true or false path, because we're dealing with three propositions, P, Q, and uh, R. So there's not much to be said about the uh, associative law or the distributive law. Um, and unfortunately, I can't fit the truth table to prove these on my whiteboard. It's, it, and it gets really messy. So I'm going to have them at the uh, end of the video and go through them. Make sure you understand them. And if you don't, go back and review the concepts of truth tables. In this video, I'll be introducing our last algebraic law of logic, De Morgan's Law. De Morgan's Law states that the negation of the conjunction is the logical equivalent of the disjunction of the negations, and also that the negation of the disjunction is the logical equivalent of the conjunction of the negations. So if we look at our truth table, I've decomposed our um, propositions here so that we have P, not P, Q, not Q, and I have it all out on the board so that I can just simply look at uh, not P and Q, which is our first law, and see that it is in fact equivalent to not P or not Q. So these two columns are equal. So we can uh, definitively say that these are logical equivalents. Also, not P or Q is the, is in fact, not P and not Q, based on our truth table. It's 100% certain. It's, this is logic, and there's uh, no argument against it. In this video, I'll be introducing the notion of conditional statements. A conditional statement contains a hypothesis and a conclusion. These are more formally known as an antecedent and a consequent. So all this is saying is that uh, when we look at these, the actual conditional, this is the hypothesis and this is a conclusion. So P implies, this is read as P implies Q and also as if P then Q. 
So P implies Q is only false when a hypothesis leads to a, fa a false conclusion or a uh, antecedent leads to, leads to a false consequence. So that's why we have, uh, if we have true implies true, that leads to a true statement. And if we have true uh, implies false, that leads to a false statement. These other three, the converse, inverse, and contra uh, contrapositive, are uh, essentially, they're just common implications that we run into, or common uh, conditional statements that we run into. And the converse is simply Q implies P, uh, inverse is not P implies not Q, and not Q implies not P, is log which is contrapositive, is logically equivalent to the original conditional statement. In this video, I'll be introducing the universal and existential quantifiers, but first I have to introduce the propositional function. The propositional function, denoted P of X, takes on a value of true or false, but it takes on a value of true or false for everything that you feed to it. So, in this case, with the universal quantifier, this is read as for every, uh, you would say for every x that is an element of the universe, p of x is either true or false for every x. Uh, the shorthand for this is for every x, p of x. You could also say uh, there exists, that's the existential quantifier, um, there exists is just stating that there is at least one so if we say there exists, an L, uh, there exists an X that is an element of the universe, we're saying there is at least one X, at least one X that is an element of the universe, such that P of X is true or false. And you can, again, use the shorthand, uh, there exists an X, P of X. So when we look at these examples, uh, for every X that is an element of the naturals, X plus 3 is greater than 4. So that is a, uh, that is a uh, false statement because the first value of the natural numbers is 1. So x plus 3 is 4, which is not greater than 4. Also, for every x is an element of the real numbers, x plus 3 is greater than 4. That is also false. I can think of, uh, well, there are infinitely many numbers that are <laughs> uh, not true for this. And then in this case, I said there does not exist an x that is an element of the naturals such that x plus 3 is greater than 4. And that is also a false statement, because uh, if I let x equal 2, it, that 2 is a natural number, and 2 plus 3 is greater than 4. So this is a false statement. There exists an element of the real numbers such that x plus 3 is greater than 4. That is a true statement, because uh, any number greater than 1 is going to yield a true statement in this case. In this video, I'm going to be going over some examples of tautologies. Tautologies are simply propositions that are always true. The first one is the law of excluded middle, which is P or not P. So for here we have P or not P, so true or false, true or false, false or true, or false or true, which yields nothing but a true column. Next we have the uh, law of contradiction. So if you ignore this negation here in this column of trues here, uh, we have P and not P. So true and false yields false, true and false yields false, false and true, false and true, all yield false. Now when we actually apply this negation to the uh, false column here, that yields a column of truths. So the law of contradiction is a tautology. Finally, we have modus tollens. Modus tollens is P implies Q and not Q implies not P. So let's break this down. P implies Q. Uh, P implies Q is only ever negative when the hypothesis predicts true and the conclusion is false. So if we have uh, true implies true here is going to be true. True implies false, that's false. False implies true is going to be true. False implies false, that's also false. I mean, that's also true. We then take this column and uh, take a conjunction with not Q. So true and not false is going to yield false. Uh, false and true is going to yield false again. False and true is going to yield false, and true and true is going to yield true. So finally, we take this column here, and that is our, uh, we imply not P. So this column implies not P. So false implying not P is going to be true. False implying false is going to be true. 
false implying true is also true, and true implying true is also true. So there you have it. We have this whole column here for modus tollens, and that is uh, therefore a tautology. The, there's nothing special about these tautologies. These are just examples of tautologies.